Uh, good morning, folks. We were talking about chapter 15 in the textbook, The Fundamentals of Ethics. Uh, we discussed the distinction between uh, absolutist, monistic moral theories versus pluralistic approaches. We talked about some of the reasons why one might be attracted to a monistic theory as opposed to a pluralistic theory, but we did know that there were some deficiencies that some people might recognize when we try to apply you know, a singular absolute theory, thus the appeal for some people of pluralism. Now, when we left last time, we had been talking about one of the things we discussed previously about utilitarianism. Because utilitarianism is flexible, it is one moral theory that is fairly good at dealing with what the author called pre pre uh, preventing catastrophes, or what we might call disaster prevention. Why flexible? Because it, because it argues that we ought to do whatever maximizes well-being. There is nothing inherently wrong with torture, for example, according to utilitarianism. There is nothing wrong with medical rationing, according to utilitarianism. Let me give you uh, the quintessential example. Suppose a disaster happens, and we only have enough resources to save a handful of people. Now, utilitarianism would say, we shouldn't try to save everyone and be quote unquote fair about it because you're likely to save no one in that case. Therefore, we have to make those difficult decisions in order to maximize utility. Does that mean treating some people unfairly? The answer is what? Yeah, that's a resounding yes because our concern is with maximizing well-being. Now, a problem for Kantians is that Kantians would have no way of preventing disasters in the way utilitarianism would. So in order to defend their theory, some util excuse me, some Kantians make modifications to help to deal with issues like catastrophe prevention. One of those things, and this is where we left off last time. And by the way, this notion of the doctrine of double effect or the DDE, this really goes all the way back to medieval scholarship. So this is not a new idea. This is an idea that, that goes way back. The doctrine of double effect, recall, attempts to defend absolutist theories like Kant's. Remember, Kant says certain things are inherently wrong in and of themselves and ought never to be intended. That's the key. They ought never to be intended. In fact, for Kant, your intent, if you are behaving morally, must always be to try to follow the moral law. Remember, being steadfast and following the moral law is how Kant defines morality. Well, what if you get into this difficulty where a high-value suspect is, has been captured and he has the information to save 100 people on an airplane? The question is, do you torture him? At first glance, torture would seem to be inherently wrong because it disrespects the dignity of an individual. The doctrine of double effect might be able, notice I say might be able to, might be able to justify torture this way. Your intent isn't to torture the person. Your intent is to respect the dignity of those people, those innocent lives on the plane. Your intent isn't to kill and torture a perpetrator. Your intent is to save innocent lives. The doctrine of double effect would say that side effect of the brutal torture of someone is indeed something that is foreseen and in a sense acknowledged, but it's not technically what? Yeah, it's not intended. Let me give you another one, folks. 
This is related to another contemporary moral problem. Perhaps some of you know that a few years ago, there was a vote taken in Ireland. They had previously had laws on the books that absolutely forbade abortion under all circumstances. A woman was having a difficult pregnancy, one such that if the pregnancy continued, both she and the fetus would die if the pregnancy continued. Ireland had an absolute ban on abortion. So they did nothing. And guess what? You had a dead woman and a dead fetus. Now, abortion may sometimes be justifiable applying the doctrine of double effect. Notice I said sometimes justifiable. If your intent is to save an innocent woman's life, even though it's foreseen that the fetus will have to expire as a result, you might be able to finagle a moral argument here. Our intent was to save an innocent woman's life. An intent to save innocent life is moral. Our intent was not to destroy the fetus. Our intent was to save the woman's life. The, the end of the fetus was foreseeable, but not technically intended. Let me give you one more. I'm going way outside of the text with example upon example. And this is the kind of thing that St. Thomas Aquinas and others were concerned with when it comes to war. There is something called the just war tradition. And because the text doesn't talk about it, I won't go into detail. But one of the long-standing principles of just war theory is that if war is deemed to be appropriate, morally acceptable, while war is taking place, non-combatant immunity is a rule. In other words, we shouldn't do what? We shouldn't be intentionally killing civilians because they are not part of the war. They are innocents. Now suppose that there is an evil dictator who is a really, really bad man. I'm trying to sound American here. Now suppose that we have decided it is just to take this man out. Now in order to do so, we are going to need to drop incendiaries. That's euphemistic for bombs. Now suppose that we can foresee that in our taking this evil dictator out, that three square blocks will be destroyed and per perhaps a hundred or more civilians. Now the doctrine of double effect is implicitly used by some people justifying this thing called, yeah, this thing called collateral damage. If your cause is just, if your intent is moral, then some foreseen but unintended consequences may sometimes be justified. Notice I say may sometimes be justified. Now folks, it, and by the way, this is just an example, so please don't think of this as political. When the U.S. led its its invasion on Iraq, we spoke of the shock and awe campaign. Well, well I guess that was Dick Cheney and Rummy, Donald Rumsfeld. The shock and awe campaign. Now, when those bombs were dropped in Baghdad, our military leaders knew full well that there would be what? Yeah, and by the way, collateral damage is euphemistic. Let's say innocent human beings who happen to live in Baghdad who did not choose their leader. In other words, innocent people. Now, of course, many people tend to take much more lightly of collateral damage when they already deem that those people don't count. In other words, if you have some racist attitudes about non-Americans or if you have nationalistic attitudes, you might just count these people as numbers. Morality would say you should never count human lives as mere numbers.
These are human beings that have lives just as valuable as your own. Now, of course, during wartime, very frequently, in the eyes of some people, collateral damage is sometimes well, it's certainly always foreseeable, but it is sometimes justified. Now, you probably figured this all out already, and I hope you thought about this in the homework question. It is sometimes very difficult to distinguish between what is intended and merely foreseen. Some critics would say, if you can foresee it to the point that you know that certain people are going to die. It seems a stretch to say that it was merely foreseen and not intended. This is why some people would call the doctrine of double effect the refuge of scoundrels. It can be used to try to justify just about any kind of atrocity. In other words, what, uh, what international law might call war crimes. Somebody might try to finagle an ethical justification of it using the doctrine of double effect. And I hope some of you realize that the doctrine of double effect should probably be used very critically. In other words, you shouldn't quickly say, well, we didn't really intend that. It was 100% foreseen, but we really didn't intend it. Natural law ethicist Philip Afoot will say the very same thing, not quite in my words, with regard to abortion. She talks about the doctrine of double effect and its application towards abortion. She says, it seems to me that if you are going to go in and crush the skull of a developing fetus, that it seems that that consequence is not merely foreseen. You know that the fetus is not going to survive. So to say that it was not in some sense intended is a stretch at best. And I hope I didn't trigger anyone there. Yeah, a stretch at best. So I hope I've made clear what's meant by the doctrine of double effect. Some of the kinds of situations it might be applied to and why there's plenty of people who are critical of the doctrine of double effect. Because they believe that it's very difficult to distinguish between what is intended and what is merely foreseen. And if you can foresee it so clearly, it seems that you in some sense have to also intend it to some extent. This is why utilitarians would have a beef with the doctrine of double effect. Because they would say, if you know that there are particular kinds of consequences, foreseen consequences, might you also actually just be thinking in terms of consequences anyway, and then trying to cover it up in Kantian guard. Trying to cover up with Kantian guard. And one other thing. It is really very difficult to determine what anyone's intent is anytime. It's sometimes even difficult to determine what one's own intent is. While I'm not a full-blown Freudian, I happen to think that Freud was quite correct about unconscious motives. We might have motives somewhere in the background that we're not even aware of ourselves that might actually be driving our decisions. And then, of course, we are conscious of other ones. And we think the conscious ones are our motive, when in fact, maybe the motives were very different from the ones we thought they were. Next. <clears throat> oh. Before I get to the doctrine of doing a, a allowing, I did want to talk a little bit about <clears throat> uh, what the author was talking about when he deals with moral conflict and contradiction. The problem with absolutist moral theories seems to be that absolutist theories would derive more than one 
principle from the absolute rule. And then if we apply that absolute rule consistently, that take a guess what would happen? We would have contradictions. Now, if a moral theory ends up leading to moral contradictions, that should mean that that particular moral theory is suspect. Because anything that produces logical contradictions is itself not logical, and we ought to reject it. This is the kind of case that a pluralist might make against ethical absolutisms, that they are liable to produce contradictions. And if they produce contradictions, perhaps we're, we're looking in the wrong direction for moral guidance. Now, the author of the text gave a very profound example. You know, this is one of those things that's difficult to, to talk about and think about too much because, well, triggering. I mean, innocent people dying. Now, this is the real life example of some Jews that were hiding out from the Nazis. You know, they were trying to escape. Guess what they had to do? An innocent babe who was trying, they were trying to escape with, was crying. If they didn't keep the baby quiet, the Nazis would have caught them and taken them all to a concentration camp. And of course, all of them would have ended up you know, suffering and dead. They ended up smothering the end. They ended up smothering the infant. Now their intent was not to do what? Yeah, the intent wasn't to kill the child. The intent was to save innocent lives from the Nazis. That was an unfortunate and regrettable necessity. That was an unfortunate and regrettable necessity. Now, the utilitarian could deal with the problem very swiftly and say, well, greatest good for the greatest number of people sometimes requires <laughs> horrific things like this in order to produce the greater good. But the traditional Kantian absolutist would say, never call smothering an innocent infant moral. You might want to call it an unintended, foreseeable necessity, but don't call it moral, because it is always immoral to intentionally destroy innocent life. And that's kind of a concern with absolutism, because absolutism, unless you use some kind of rhetorical gymnastics, would seem to make it impossible to prevent certain kinds of catastrophes, like the example I was just talking about. Next. This is another minor gear shift. The last part of the chapter discusses the doctrine of doing and allowing. Now, fortunately, the, re, the, the fourth edition of the textbook gets the reference correct. In order to introduce the doctrine of doing and allowing, the author of the text brings in an example from Christopher Nolan's Batman. Oh, there's a few Christopher Nolan fans out there. Those, they're my favorite of the Batman movies because they all sort of have philosophical case. On them. In other words, there's philosophical stuff all throughout the Christopher Nolan ver uh, Batman version. Now, the first of these movies is Batman Begins. The previous edition, the author screwed up and called it the Dark Knight. Like, oh man, that was the second of the movies. It was Batman Begins is the one that he's referring to. Near the end of the film, Batman and his former mentor, now nemesis, are doing dubious battle on, the ele on an elevated train. The elevated train 
is going towards the uh, the way uh, the Wayne Building, and it's going to explode. It's loaded with explosives. His nemesis believes that Gotham is you know, cannot be redeemed. You know, basically society has gone to Hades, and it needs to be cleansed and rebuilt anew. We might call him a sort of principal fanatic, if I can use that kind of phrase. He is willing to destroy all of Gotham for his perceived greater good. Now, the train, of course, comes apart, and Ra's al Ghul, played by Liam Neeson, you know, is going to fall out of the train and die. And he kind of mocks Batman. He goes, ah, your principles. He goes, you can't kill me. Your principles won't allow you to do it. To which he responds, I'm not going to kill you, but I don't have to save you. And he falls out of the train, ah, and you know, Batman flies out with his winged, winged cape, and he escapes, and Ra's al Ghul ends up, <laughs> yes, ends up blowing up. Now, the point the author's trying to make here is this little bit from this cinematic example is a quintessential example of the kind of thinking that goes on with the, the, the doctrine of doing and allowing. It makes the distinction between doing harm versus merely allowing harm to take place. Batman says, I'm not going to kill you, but I don't have to save you. That is a, a, a quintessential kind of thinking of the doctrine of doing and allowing. Now, the reason why the doctrine of doing and allowing likely appeals to some people, not necessarily me, is because it suggests that there is a difference between a, an agent actually doing something as opposed to merely stepping back and letting the chips fall where they may. Go back to that example I was talking about where where the Irish hospital refused to save the woman's life by giving an abortion. They were implicitly justifying their behavior by saying, we did not kill the woman or the fetus. We merely let them die. <laughs> they knew that that was going to happen, but they could not dirty their hands with an abortion. I hope most of you got that in other words, this is the thing. The doing the harm would, would leave the agent with dirty hands. Whereas the idea is, if you say hands off, you're not actually doing anything. Ergo, there is a moral difference between the two. <clears throat> Ho folks, I hope you realize that in some circumstances, the doctrine of doing and allowing would seem to make sense. But in other circumstances, perhaps it's a little bit more dubious. Now, let me give you a couple of examples. Huh, yeah. Philosophers and their trolley cars. Now, suppose we've got. Da -da 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 -da. Here's a child on the tracks. Remember, it doesn't matter how the child got there. You're supposed to suspend disbelief. Here's you. Your nest egg is on this track over here. You know, whatever happens to give you financial security is over here. If you don't pull the switch, this child is going to die. If you do pull the switch, your nest egg, your financial security is ruined. Many people might justify in their own minds, I did not kill the child. I merely didn't do the things that needed to be done to save the child's life. 
Peter Singer will present a thought experiment very much like this one in his solution to poverty and world hunger. He will argue that many of us who could do a great deal of good by, in helping the poor and needy do not do so when we easily could. Peter Singer suggests that the excuse that we make for ourselves, I didn't kill the child, I merely didn't help the child, really is no excuse at all. Just like the same way that Fat Man certainly could have saved Ra's al Ghul, but he didn't. It would have been easy for him to save him, save him but he didn't. Meaning that he intended him to die, even if not directly, at least indirectly. So it seems strange to some people like Peter Singer to suggest that you are not somehow culpable. If you are aware of the situation, you could easily help, but you don't do so. Because you're thinking about yourself in this case because you're thinking about yourself in this case. Now, let me give you one more. And I alluded to this one in, in the previous lecture. In the, my D2L module, I have a PDF file of a classic essay by, by James Rachels. James Rachels is no longer with us, but he wrote widely on medical ethics as well as a lot of other issues in ethics. One of his main areas that he wrote widely on is on the, on the topic of so-called active euthanasia. That is when we actually take direct action to end a suffering person's life. Now, folks, traditionally, the American Medical Association made a distinction between so-called active and so-called passive euthanasia. Active euthanasia would be when an outside party assists a, per a terminally ill person in ending his life. Passive euthanasia is doctrine of doing and allowing kind of stuff, withholding treatment, not doing anything to hasten death, but merely allowing death to take place. Now, James Rachels lays out the position of the American Medical Association. And by the way, this was back in the 70s, the late 70s when he wrote this essay. Remember, because all of you have rights and you have rights to inform consent and a right to make your own medical decisions, the medical professionals will tell you the situation and then you get to do what? Yeah, yeah choose what treatment or what you want to take place and sign off on it. Now, very, he, he notes that very frequently, children who have Down syndrome are born with intestinal blockages a large number of the time. It was policy of the, medic, of the AMA for them to explain this situation when the child was born with an, with an intestinal blockage uh, to, to, the, to the legal guardians. And they would say, look, we've got two options here. We operate to remove the intestinal blockage or we let nature take its course. It is for you to decide, not for the physicians to decide, but for you to decide. Now, very frequently, people made the decision to let nature take its course, which means that the child will die miserably after several days of dehydration. That's what it means. Now, the idea was, this is not actively killing the child, so it's morally permissible. It's merely doing what? Killing versus letting die. Now, this implicitly 
appeals to the doctrine of doing and allowing. We didn't take actual action to kill the child. We merely let nature take its course. Now, to show this, this potential weakness of the doctrine of doing and allowing, I will give you a watered-down version of Rachel's rebuttal here. He's, he argues that when you let nature take its course, it is disingenuous to say that you have not done anything. Because you have done something in your lives. You have made a value judgment and then made a decision not to act, which is in its own way a kind of acting. Even if you didn't physically do anything, you made the moral decision, or immoral, depending on your point of view, to do nothing. Because it would be very easy to perform the surgery. And guess what? He realizes that it is because of bigotry and because of the difficulty of dealing with a differently abled child that would lead people to say, we didn't kill the child, we let the child die. He says the reality is you did do something. You made the value judgment that the child is better off dead. And when you say the child is better off dead, you also mean that you are better off if the child weren't to survive. He says, it is disingenuous to say that you did not do anything. You made a value judgment. And then you acted on that. Acted by, by not acting. When in fact, the surgery would be what? It's a routine surgery that could have easily been done. Now he says, if you made the value judgment that the child is better off dead, it seems cruel to do what? to let the child waste away painfully over a matter of days. He argues that if you, make, if you believe that that's a moral decision to let the child die, it would probably be more moral to actually say what? Perhaps we should end the child's misery right away. That is, if you care about the individual suffering. That is, if you care about the individual suffering. In a sense, folks, to do nothing is to make a choice. Sometimes inaction is action. And I think I said this on someone's homework paper. The reason why I think many people implicitly think that there is something wrong with this distinction, at least some of the time, is because most of you believe that good Samaritan laws make sense. Otherwise, our legislators would not have passed such laws. I forget what they're really called, but they're you know, more commonly called good Samaritan laws. If you can help somebody in distress out with little overall difficulty for you, you ought to what? You ought to do it. Suppose somebody's bleeding to death. Right then and there, he said, well, I didn't kill the person. I merely didn't do anything to help the person. Now, notice we would not hold the average person accountable in this way. Why? Because not everyone's a what? You know, has the expertise or the knowledge to know what to do. This is why we encourage everybody to get what kind of training? Yeah, at least basic CPR and basic first aid training. So technically, anybody could at least attempt to do a minimalist intervention. Yeah, we don't hold we don't hold people responsible for putting their own lives in danger to help someone, but we do think that people have, generally speaking, an obligation to help people out in a situation like that, an emergency. If we wouldn't be putting ourselves out too drastically, and if we have some kind of reasonable ability to do good. This is why many people would say inaction in some cases is tantamount to, you know, to willfully letting a person die. 
and we would actually hold such people morally culpable for inaction. For inaction. Because it looks like you wantonly don't even care about another human being. This is why I hope some of you recognize that the doctrine of doing and allowing, even if it might seem reasonable in some circumstances, you know, in other circumstances, uh, is weak at best. Now let me give you one more example. This is not the doctrine of doing and allowing per se, but this is something we've discussed before. Modifications to the trolley car. Remember, when a person is causing some kind of harm for a greater good, we have said that most people don't have as much of a problem if it's merely pushing a switch. Whereas if you look at situations where it's something much more active, we typically end up in a moral quandary. By the way, Sam Harris talks about this famous case in his book, The Moral Landscape. Phil Foote also refers to it in an essay that some of you might take a look at on the doctrine of double effect. This is the modified trolley car experiment where you're, you and your corpulent friend are on an overpass. And the out of control trolley car is careening towards 10 innocent workers. You know that if you push your corpulent friend off, that it will slow down the train enough that those 10 innocent lives will be able to be saved. You can't throw yourself off because you're too darn small and wouldn't make any difference and they would end up dying anyway. So the question is, do you push your friend off? Well, clearly the trolley car thought experiment was going to say, saving 10 innocent lives is more important than one innocent life, even though it's regrettable. That's doctrine of, of double effect talk. Utilitarianism, of course, would call it a no-brainer. But guess what? While most people would be willing to throw the switch, fewer numbers of people are willing to do one tiny push. And this is one of those moral psychology thought experiments. Guess why this is? It's because it's visceral. It feels like you are actually doing something. When you're just pressing a button, it doesn't feel like you're actually doing it. But when you actually have to contact the body, and push the body off, it feels like you are somehow more responsible for that person's death. And if this reminds you of something from uh, from a psychology class, good. Most of you probably remember the experiment conducted by Stanley Milgram et al. That was the obedience study. When you are merely administering an electric shock by pressing a button, it's not the same as being in someone's face and tasing them. Do you get my drift here? In other words, it feels morally different even though there is really no moral significance at all. But it feels different to people. This is part of why the doctrine of doing and allowing makes visceral sense to people. Because when you physically do something, it feels like you, the agent, are responsible. But when you're not doing anything at all, well, I didn't do anything, well, Inaction is sometimes doing something. But you get the sense that you are not truly responsible for it. Now, I already discussed this. Do make sure moving forward that you do understand what the distinction made by the doctrine of doing and allowing is and what kinds of things that it might be used to try to justify and whether or not you generally agree or disagree with it. You should be able to do the same thing with the doctrine of double effect. And do keep in mind the kinds of people who are likely to use these doctrines. 
are those who hold absolutist theories like natural law ethics or, of course, Kantian ethics. The utilitarian needs no rhetorical gymnastics because utilitarianism holds that nothing is inherently wrong in and of itself except for failure to abide by the principle of utility. So I hope you appreciate that distinction. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs>